Hi everybody and welcome to Digital VLSI Design, a course that's given at Bar Ilan University in the Faculty of Engineering. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann and this is a course I've developed over the last few years and I wanted to share it with you and so I'm recording it. A few things before we start. I'm a member of NX Labs at Bar Ilan University. NX is the Emerging Nanoscaled Integrated Circuits and Systems Labs. Here's a picture of uh, our faculty. Um, that's a very beautiful faculty in Ramat Gan, Israel. And we're part of uh, the Electrical Engineering Department in the Nanoelectronics track. And our labs are called EDX. And one of the things that we are doing, we're educating the future of chip design in Israel. Um, we're also doing some great research, so if you're interested in knowing about it, drop me an email and I will tell you about it. So we're going to start with our introduction lecture to this course, and here's a bit about the, the outline. We'll start with motivation, then we'll go over a bit about building a chip, we'll discuss some of the basics of design automation, and we'll finish this introductory lecture with an overview of the chip design flow. So we'll start with motivation and introduction. What is the motivation behind this course? So what you see here is the uh, patent for the integrated circuit that came out in 1964. Um, the integrated circuit, which is maybe in some uh, areas of pop culture less known than, than the invention of the transistor, is one of the most important inventions of, uh, of our time and maybe of history, and maybe just as important as the transistor. It was the ability to actually put several devices on one monolithic substrate and it led the way to computers as we know them today. The next step that I just wanted to point out in kind of motivation came in 1971 and that's when Intel broke out um, making this chip, the Intel 4004, which was the first monolithic microprocessor when they put 2,300 transistors on one chip and created a whole microprocessor that was on one single substrate. So as you see in the few years that passed from the invention of the integrated circuit, they were already able to go three orders of magnitude higher in the amount of, um, of, uh, of functionality they could put on the chip if uh, one transistor is functionality. Intel, of course, has led the way for a long time in this, uh, in, in this field. And in 1992, the Intel 486 DX2 was the first or one of the first um, mm, processors to have more than a million transistors integrated on a single die. So you see again we went three orders of magnitude higher from a thousand transistors to a million. And of course we've long surpassed that level of a billion transistors and here in 2006 Intel put out the Itanium 2 Montecito processor with 1.7 billion transistors. So you see there's been a lot of advance and progress in this field and the integration of transistors has grown exponentially according to Moore's law. If we go to a more modern processor, you here have the Core i7-6950X Extreme Edition, or also known as the Broadwell E architecture. And you see this is a very, very big chip with a lot of stuff going on. Um, you can see here in the middle uh, a bit of the architecture of, uh, uh, of the chip, uh, some of the block diagrams that discuss how it uh, works. And we see different uh, data here in, in that I collected here in this table on the right. So this was introduced in 2016 and it's already in a 14 nanometer FinFET process. That's a three-dimensional process, 14 nanometers, that's really, really small, way smaller than anyone ever would have um, dreamt of a long time ago. It has a lot of memory on it, reaching 25 megabytes in the L3 cache. And uh, it has 10 cores on, on the chip. It can run 20 threads in parallel. It runs at a frequency of a few gigahertz, and it has a 246 millimeter die size. That's pretty big. Um, it, this chip has over 3.2 billion transistors on it from, uh, from data I was able to find. So you see, this is a big monster. But there is a problem. As you can see in this graph, uh, this is kind of a uh, type of graph that is shown in different places and you see that we have plotted two things um, on the bottom we have the year um, where we have one scale on the right is the productivity which is how many transistors uh, or theoretical transistors each staff each engineer can deal with and you see that has grown exponentially because this is a logarithmic graph but on the left here we have the logic uh, transistors per chip, according to Moore's law, which has also grown on an exponent. 
The only thing is that you see that the uh, scale of the growth on, uh, on the logic transistors per chip is much larger than the productivity of how much a person can deal with, even with uh, the different tools that we, we use to, to help us grow this exponentially. And this has caused a gap to, um, to come along. And uh, this has been known and called Moore's Law of Engineers. So one of the things that we're gonna discuss and motivation for this course is how we can go and close this gap or what we can do with all of these transistors that we're putting on a chip. Um, just another piece of there, if we are talking about those big chips and, and so forth, we can take a, a theoretical system on a chip here and here's a block diagram of what could be, for example, a system on chip that's inside a cell phone. And you see you have all these different blocks that do different things, right? You have some uh, video codec that can take our input from our camera and compress it. You have a Bluetooth uh, piece here and a GPS piece here, which also has an RF that talks, uh, that, that gets the reception of the GPS. We have another RF block that does our communication. We have some analog blocks. We have clocking. We have audio, for example, talking to the microphone and playing in our, uh, in our speaker. We have the screen, maybe some sort of keyboard or other input, power management, and so forth. We have all these different things. They can all be integrated on one chip, and that's really, really complicated. So how on earth should we design such a thing? So the solution I've divided into three categories, and those three categories are as such. First, we start with design abstraction. If we abstract away each part of our, um, our design of our engineering uh, task and each factor in, in the, in, in, uh, each engineer or each team of engineers is specializes in one part of it but can get inputs from other engineers, can give outputs to other engineers, we can specialize in our one part, do it the best we can and uh, we can deal with a bigger problem by connecting all of those different abstractions together. So design abstraction is one key to solving such a problem. Our second key to solving this problem is known as design automation. In each part of dealing with these mini, mini, mini transistors and this very uh, difficult functionality, we need to make automation. We need to use our computers to work for us and help us get um, more out of what we can do. So design automation, or in our case, we often call it EDA, electric design automation, is a key part to how we can deal with this huge problem. And the third thing I would like to point out is design reuse. It's also known as IP or intellectual property. Um, and design reuse means that if somebody already has designed something, why don't we just use it instead of trying to design everything ourselves? So that can either be going and buying something off shelf or designing it inside our company by a different team. The course uh, that we will follow has um, 10 lectures starting from this introduction through different levels of learning how to do register transfer level design with Verilog, going through logic synthesis, static timing analysis, um, moving to the physical domain and starting the back end or, or physical implementation stage, going through placement, clock tree synthesis, routing, and discussing a bit uh, IO and packaging and design for test. Um, we're going to see in this how to do these things hands on. We're going to learn some of the algorithms uh, behind it, and we're going to learn a lot about how to do this correctly and how we deal with all these problems and make these amazing chips. I uh, designed this course based on a lot, lot, lot of uh, data, starting with um, stuff that I learned when I was an a back-end engineer and different things I did during my different um, degrees in academic research. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, lot, of uh, stuff that I found available on the internet, starting with Rob Rutenbar's From Logic to Layout course on Coursera, which uh, I, I took a lot of uh, concepts from. Um, Nir Sever, a friend and a big technologist here in Israel, um, taught a small course when I was a, a, when I was a graduate student, and I uh, took some stuff from him. And there are several others, of course, um, Jan Rabai's and David uh, Harris's books and um, Cadence Support, Synopsis SolveNet, and many other um, references that you can find online. So that was the motivation and introduction for this course. And now we'll go over to the second part, building a chip. So there's a general design approach basically for any engineering problem. 
So I can answer a question or ask a question. How should engineers build a bridge? A very difficult and big task. And the answer is, how do you go about and do this type of thing? You divide and conquer. Each part you abstract away and each uh, different team of engineers does one task that we can all glue together. So we start by partitioning the design. We make many sub problems that each sub problem is manageable. Often this partitioning happens hierarchically. So each sub design is partitioned into many other sub designs and so forth until one engineer or one team of engineers can go and carry it out. Okay, we have to usually define a mathematical model for the sub problem and find an algorithmic solution for it. Um, this helps us model what we're going to do, see how it's going to work, and so forth. But you really have to be careful of model limitations and check them because if we have a bad model or an incorrect model, then garbage in, garbage out, and whatever we did will not work in the end. Okay. Once we have our model, we develop the solution for the model, then we uh, start to implement the algorithm. We use different design tools, some design automation, and we have to define interfaces between the different parts. So for example, in our um, picture over here, we have the interface. This type of a block has a hole on it. This type of a block has a little connector. And we know that this type of connector will uh, hook up to this type of hole. And when each team of engineers built their little puzzle piece, they'll connect together at the end. So interfaces are very critical. We need to define our inputs. We need to define our outputs. The next uh, abstraction level has to receive our outputs. And the previous abstraction level has to provide their outputs as inputs to ours. Okay. Uh, it's very important to implement checking tools for boundary conditions. We need to verify and validate our design. So um, usually this is done by a third party. So if the designer comes and uh, designs whatever block he's doing, we usually take a different team, a different engineer, an outsider to come and verify that what we did is what we meant to do. It's very important to do this by somebody else and not by the person who's designing. So some sort of basic mistake that's in there doesn't uh, continue on with us and we think it's the correct thing. Okay. Finally, we need to connect everything. We need to make a flow. We need to concatenate the design tools to general design flows that can be managed. So we have very important flows, a process of things step by step that we pass. Okay. Finally, we see what works, what doesn't work, and we go back to the beginning and rethink of how we're doing our design. So I've discussed abstraction several times. So let's discuss basic design abstraction in our field of chip design. There are several ways to look at this. Um, any different lecturer can describe this in different ways, but I will, I will show it in the following. So we start with the system level. Um, describing the system is a very large abstract thing. Dive into what we call register transfer level, or better known as RTL which we will discuss many, many times throughout the course. In fact, we'll learn all about RTL in the next lecture. Um, RTL will be synthesized into gate level, which is a, a description of how we have different logic digital gates and how they're connected together. Um, the gates are built out of transistors or out of single devices. So if we have these gates that uh, we if we have these transistors that we connect them together, we can build a gate and then we don't have to think about the, the transistors anymore. The transistors actually are a bunch of different uh, photo masks that are generated in a certain way and then they go through process design steps that make the physical actual electronic thing that uh, can create these transistors and that's called the layout level. And the mask level is the actual photo masks that we use to make these. So um, I'll go over these things in the next few slides but I just wanted to show that we do this design from top down. We start with the system and we go down all the way to the mask level. We have to do everything but it's very important to verify that what we did from the bottom up every single step of the way what we did is what we meant to do and it works. Okay, a different view of this uh, process uh, in uh, computer ar architecture or chip design uh, it comes over here on, on the right. So starting from the top, we have an application or an algorithm that uh, we want to carry out. But starting from the bottom, we have the basic physics, you know, Ohm's law and Maxwell's law and so forth that we have to, to do. So we use the physics to make devices. And once we have a device such as a transistor, we can take those transistors, put them together to build some sort of a circuit. Okay, um, if we have a circuit, for example, uh, the gate level that we had over here, we can 
make different um, logic units and we can use register transfer level language to describe what type of logic we want to do and there is a direct copy uh, direct translation from this register transfer transfer level to the circuits that we have below um, we then build a micro architecture of how we can carry out different types of uh, instructions and different type of operations using um, uh, at a higher level and we can describe that with our register transfer level um, usually on top of the micro architecture we have some sort of instruction set architecture so a more um, abstract way of describing the things um, that is taking care of step by step with our microarchitecture. On top of our instruction set architecture, we have something like an operating system that knows how to use it or, or compiled programming languages, okay? And they already carry out our applications and algorithms, um, which are written in one of these higher level programming languages. So that's another view of this type of design abstraction that we have. Again, most engineers or most people are only uh, really experts at one or another of these levels and not more than them and in fact each one of them has teams that each one is uh, is an expert in some sort of sub level but uh, as long as for example we take our circuits if we're at the circuits we have to have input from the device guys such as the models of the transistors and we have output such as the gates and their characteristics that then can be used by this register transfer level so these guys in the circuit level um, they only are experts at that. They know how to use these model files. They don't know actually how to make these devices. They don't even have to know the math behind the physics. Um, but they know how to use these types of devices in order to build gates. The guys at the register transfer level don't need to know how to make the actual gates or how to connect the circuits together. All they need to do is know that we have these circuits, they have this type of functionality, and then they can use them. And that's how we divide and conquer. So let's start going over these different levels um, just for a quick moment. So system level abstraction, which is out of the scope of this course, but just to talk about it, we have some sort of algorithm or application or whatever, and we will describe it at a high level, for instance, with uh, C or system C or some other programming language. And we describe at a very high level what we want to do. It's very abstract because it doesn't have any implementation details or any timing uh, inside. And it's very efficient to start up and, and make a compact execution model as a first design that shows us kind of how the thing is going to work and kind of what it uh, what it's going to do um, but it's uh, different uh, difficult to maintain throughout the project because there is no link to implementation it's a very high level thing um, if you want to learn about it I, I suggest taking an embedded systems course going from the system level down to the register transfer level and that is already part of our curriculum here, we have a cycle accurate model, model that's very close to the hardware implementation. We use bit vector data types and operations um, that are abstractions from bit level implementation. So basically we have a bunch of zeros and ones which are usually um, some sort of a voltage level and uh, we we uh, use these zeros and ones as bits and we can build bit vectors out of them and everything we do in register transfer level is using these bit vectors such as you can see here a 32-bit register okay um, we use different types of sequential constructs such as if then else um, to support the modeling of complex control flow and uh, uh, we will learn about that a lot in our next lecture and we'll know how to exactly describe register transfer level. Um, register transfer level is still a behavioral description, it's a high level description, but in the end we have to make these logic gates that, uh, that, that we're, we, can, we know how to uh, physically implement. So we need to take that register transfer level and make this gate level abstraction. Okay, um, the gate level abstraction means that we can make some sort of a f usually a finite state machine to make a sequential system. And we can take a finite state machine and turn it into a bunch of logic gates, such as the NAND gates that are shown over here and the flip flop that's shown over here, and carry out um, whatever we wrote in the register transfer level um, uh, using Boolean logic. Okay, uh, another thing about this is that when, once we have gates, we can know characteristics such as the actual delay of the gates. Here you see this is a 3 nanosecond delay, and this is a 5 nanosecond delay, and so forth. And we can look at the, the, uh, the gates and have different models that um, tell us what the delays, what the power, and so forth of the gates, maybe even of the wires at the gate level abstraction. Um, from uh, from the gate level, we, we have to dive down into the transistor level all the way to the mask level. And actually, that's, again, out of the scope of this course. And I will uh, maybe uh, describe it in other courses in the future. But um, 
the 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 transistor uh, level we have these compact models that describe how the devices work um, that enable us to to run circuit simulation and use that to build our gates that we can use for our RTL okay um, we have the layout level which is actually how to take those transistors and design the actual layers and polygons that will um, connect them together and uh, will be able to to fabricate them and then we have the masks which is taking this layout type of stuff and creating the actual photolithographical masks that we can use to do a uh, fabrication process so I'm not going to discuss that much here um, I just want to take a break and discuss something that I think I will go into every um, every lesson, uh, every lecture during this course, and it's the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame. And it's just a kind of an inspiring side note that uh, there is this uh, thing on IEEE called the Chip Hall of Fame, where they took famous microprocessors, and I want to point out a, a few. So I will start with that same uh, CPU that started it all that um, we discussed before, the Intel 4004. And it, again, was the first commercially available monolithic CPU. So it was the first time that they ever took all the components of a microprocessor and put them on one single substrate. It was released in 1971 with 2,300 transistors. And remember, that is uh, not that long ago, and we've already uh, had many, many orders of magnitude uh, higher ability to do this integration on a die. It's pretty amazing from thousand transistors now we're talking about billions of transistors on the, on the same type of a chip um, as you can see the the chip was in this type of a, pa a dual inline package um, with only a few maybe uh, something like 16 um, pins on it that could connect to it it ran at a really high frequency of 740 kilohertz so you see we got kind of faster in the last uh, few decades and the process technology was 10 micron PMOS technology. Remember um, that Intel chip we showed from a couple of years ago is already 14 nanometer FinFET. So we're talking about microns versus nanometers. There's a, a, another three orders of magnitude difference in, in the size of each transistor, basically. Um, it also, uh, uh, um, interestingly, had a 4-bit data bus. You don't really find 4-bit computers around much uh, anymore. Um, this was actually uh, interestingly designed as a side project. So Intel was a uh, memory company. They wanted to develop and sell DRAM, but they, um, from what they say, they were trying to keep uh, some cash flow. So they got this side project and they hired this guy, Federico Fagan, who was a, uh, a, a chip designer. They didn't have actually logic designers. And he um, basically, uh, the guy who's shown here, looking at the layout of the, uh, of the 4004, he's the one who carried out this project pretty much on his own. Um, and uh, it was actually a project that was designed for a uh, Japanese company called Buzicom who wanted to make this calculator and Intel designed a uh, chipset called the MCS4 chipset, which were four chips, 4001, 4002, 3, and 4004, where the 4004 was this microprocessor that they decided to put on one chip and um, they made a deal with uh, Buzicom that they could actually sell it to other people and this um, chip became a very popular product and started Intel as we know it today. So now we'll start discussing design automation. So if we go back to the really olden days, um, everything was done by hand. So here you have the schematic of the Intel 4004, and you see you could put the schematic of the chip, I don't know if this is the whole thing, but at least a good part of it on a piece of paper. Kind of hard to do when you start having millions or billions of transistors, right? Um, they actually used to do uh, work with some CAD tools, some. Uh, computer-aided design tools such as this mainframe CAD system already back in, in, the, in the late 60s. And you see that they actually use this type of a digitizer or this type of a, uh, uh, of a stylus. Um, it was not exactly what is shipped in nowadays with these, uh, uh, with these uh, iPad Pros or with uh, Microsoft Surface, but it was the, the way that they used to put different coordinate, uh, coordinates into, into a system. Okay, um, everything was done by hand. As you can see, they used this type of millimeter paper to draw, um, hand draw gate layout. 
And um, here you can see that they had uh, an overlay, for example, of an 8088, which we will discuss uh, in the next lecture. Um, you can see that the whole chip kind of was, uh, uh, was printed out and plotted. Um, they used to use these things with this uh, like light table um, to make the actual design to, to de develop the photo masks with. And um, if you know the word tape out, which is when we actually send the files to the fabrication uh, plant nowadays, um, most people will tell you that tape out is uh, when they take a cassette because it used to be that da big data was put on a cassette they would record all of the data for the photo masks onto a uh, cassette and send it to the fabrication plant for uh, fabrication but uh, I heard a story from uh, professor Steve Kong who said that um, what they used to do is they used to go and take the uh, gym at the at the local uh, high school and put all of the uh, plots for the um, for the chip uh, on the on the floor of the basketball court and they used to tape them together with uh, with tape and uh, that's how they would run their DRC and LVS checks so tape out is actually the tape because you would tape together these plots and put them together I'm not sure which story is correct but I found a picture here of what I would call the original type of a tape out so design automation today has changed a bit. We don't do anything basically by hand. We have tools for each level of design automation. So starting with design, high level synthesis tools or logic synthesis tools um, are at the RTL and system level. Um, then we have uh, schematic capture for designing transistors, layout uh, tools for doing the layout and and tools, uh, similar tools for doing PCB design. We have simulation tools that d run simulations on the transistors um, using compact models. We have logic simulation tools that use uh, a Boolean uh, um, equivalents of the uh, different types of uh, um, logic gates. We have hardware emulation, which I will discuss a bit later. And we have lower level things like technology CAD and field solvers that help us look at each and every atom where they're going and, and design devices. Um, we, of course, have an analysis and verification tools to see what we designed actually works. So, for example, functional verification we do to make sure that our digital design is doing what we, we decided and wanted it to. We have formal verification that brings some mathematical analysis tools to make sure um, that it is doing what we wanted. Equivalence checking is a type of formal verification that looks at our RTL and our, our gate um, level uh, design and see that they're the same. Static timing analysis checks timing and we'll learn how to use that within this course. Physical verification is like DRC LVS, clock domain crossing, checks that we don't have any asynchronous uh, clock crossing. We also have validation for, for post-silicon, such as automatic test pattern generation or ATPG and built-in self-test or BIST, which help us put uh, a gain controllability and uh, observability on the chip after um, after fabrication so we know that we're actually delivering good chips and we also have different tools that do uh, things on mass preparation such as ox uh, opti optical proximity correction or OPC and other things that help us make the masks and there are many 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 more tools I just wanted to show you that there is a large array of these and we'll actually be using quite a few of them um, we're going to be using in this course a cadence flow thanks to the cadence academic network which provides us at Bar Ilan University with a lot of support and so we're going to do our RTL in Verilog there is also VHDL but we choose to use Verilog which is the uh, main standard used in a lot of the high-tech industry um, and then we're going to do synthesis with cadence genus place and route with uh, Cadence Inovis and inside Cadence Inovis we have several tools that are integrated Tempest for timing, Voltus for power estimation, Parasitic Extraction with QRC or Qantas and Clock Tree Synthesis with CCOpt and we're going to do uh, simulation with Cadence Incisive so um, thanks to the Cadence Academic Network for supporting this course. So now we'll move on to the last part of our lecture the chip design flow. So how do we build a chip? So here's a basic overview of the steps that we use or the flow to build a chip. We start with the stage of definition and planning. We go into the front end design, which is the design and verification of the chip. We, then we start the, the maneuver over to the back end design, which is, starts with logic synthesis. And we go over to the, the core of the back end or the physical design or physical implementation of the chip. Finally, once we finish doing everything, we do a, what's called sign-off to make sure that everything is done all right, and we send our chip 
or are designed to the foundry for fabrication in a, a step that's called a tape out. In the end, we get our uh, chip back and we do silicon validation in the lab or on the tester. Um, but we can't forget there are different steps such as package and board design, software design, doing a test plan and so forth that are often more strenuous than everything we're going to be talking about in this course. So let's start with definition and planning. There are many different three-letter words of uh, different design documents that uh, you can hear from uh, management and marketing and so forth, but we usually start with a marketing requirements document which says what we want to make in our chip, what our clients were, are going to need for uh, when the chip is ready and how we're going to sell as many of them as possible. And then we, uh, uh, the management um, makes this kind of a document that says what is going to be on the chip. Um, this is uh, passed over to the chip architecture team, which starts to define the buses, the connectivity, partitions the different functionality we have on the chip, makes a high level system model, uh, decides what the bandwidth, the power, the frequency of the chip uh, is going to be, what kind of envelopes it's going to meet, and uh, what what's going to be done in hardware versus software, how many cores we're going to have, what types of memories and sizes are going to be on the chip, etc. Um, then uh, the, the architecture gives this over to the design teams and each design team comes and subpartitions this into smaller blocks which each for each block we make a uh, document that s discusses the design if it's a small enough uh, design or a, sub a small enough subpartition we actually start drawing the state machines drawing the types of waveforms we expect to see and what our different interfaces are in, uh, in the actual design we're going to be designing and once we do that we can actually start the logic design itself um, at the same time, we have to discuss uh, the, the board requirements, the size of the chip, and how the floor plan is going to be set out. We're going to discuss all that um, within the course. Uh, a very important step, which maybe isn't thought of very much, is the process in FAB. So there are a lot, lot, lot. Uh, 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 uh is the process in the fab. So there are actually um, a lot of different types of processes and process flavors that you can choose from. They come at different prices. They have different features and specifications. And one of the main things is deciding on what type of a process we're going to use, which has a lot of effect on the actual performance and specifications of our chip in the end. Finally, we go to project kickoff and we transfer all these designs to the implementation teams. Okay, so um, that dives us down from the definition and planning to the design and verification stage. And design is usually, as we said before, RTL, register transfer level design. Okay, so um, in the RTL, we describe uh, the design in Verilog or uh, VHDL or something similar, and we will discuss that in the next lecture. Um, we also take IPs, these intellectual property, these blocks that we uh, have off the shelf either from a different team in our company or that we bought from somebody or licensed from somebody and we have to integrate them with the rest of our chip we have to run different checks like linters and synthesability checks we usually do formal verification that shows that uh, we are actually checking every single thing inside a certain block if we can according to a mathematical model and we do a, a functional verification on all the IPs which is usually divided to different levels unit level subsystem level and full chip level um, and try to get as much coverage of our verification as possible um, there is uh, the step of IP integration is very important to discuss. We have a basic uh, categorization into two tarp types of IPs, a hard IP and a soft IP. So a soft IP is basically RTL code that we receive from, uh, again, another team in our company or from a vendor, and it may, be, may come encrypted even. And we take it and we synthesize it and, and place it and route it with the rest of the chip. Um, sometimes it also includes behavioral models for simulation. But it's very easy to move a soft IP from one process and, and so forth to another. However, it, it takes us a lot of work to integrate it and make it work um, uh, at the specification we need. The other type is the hard IP. A hard IP is, is uh, provided by an IP provider um, as already a, a pre-existing layout. In other words, that they actually went and they did 
the uh, whole implementation, the synthesis or uh, or custom design and the layout and uh, extraction and they and they um, uh, learned its specifications. So it's it's provided along with timing models, layout abstracts, behavioral models for simulation. Sometimes it has full spice models and full layouts and so forth. And uh, we will see this in this course as we are going to have uh, custom. We we're going to have digital blocks such as um, library cells. Uh, standard cell libraries, RAMs, ROMs, PLLs, uh, sometimes processors come this way, IO cells, and so forth. So there's a big difference because hard IPs are designed exactly for one type of process and one flavor of the process, and uh, they cannot be migrated easily from process to process. But then again, as a, it, when we receive this and need to integrate it, we just take this kind of a black box and stick it in our, in our floor plan, and it's much easier uh, to deal with in that way. Uh, and we figure that it's already been verified and debugged by the IP provider. Another issue is prototyping. So there are different levels of verification, starting from specification-driven testing through bug-driven testing, coverage-driven testing, and regression. But there's a uh, uh, rather new-ish, I'm talking about uh, last few decades, but still a newish paradigm, which is actually going and prototyping our design on an FPGA. So since FPGAs uh, have gotten bigger with more capacity, we can take a lot of our design and synthesize it to the FPGA, put it on the FPGA, and then all of our verification is done at hardware speeds and not software speeds, and we can get a lot more coverage in that way. An FPGA, however, is not the exact same gate level that we will be having in our um, in our actual chip so it doesn't check everything and that's why in the last few years another design uh, another prototyping paradigm has uh, arisen which is called hardware emulation where we take one of these big boxes such as this cadence palladium which has uh, uh, several uh, hundred cores on it and you can map the actual gate level of big big units maybe even a whole chip to these palladiums and actually test uh, gate level at, at speeds that we can actually wait for so this is a very important type of uh, verification nowadays okay moving on to logic synthesis and now we're already down into the core of our uh, course what we're going to be doing so I'll just touch on this and then lecture three dives into logic synthesis how this is done and we'll actually go ahead and do it so logic synthesis is the process of taking a, a high level uh, behavioral model a register transfer level and turning it into actual gates so if you look at this code here it's Verilog or register transfer level code of that describes a D flip-flop and what the, what the synthesis process will do will take this and turn it into this which we'll see next lecture how it's done okay um, um, so what this receives is inputs because we said at each stage we have to receive inputs and provide outputs. So the inputs are different things such as the technology library file which describes the technology. We have the RTL files that maybe we wrote or maybe somebody else wrote. We have these constraint files called SDC which describe what our optimization goal is and we may have some design for test definitions that we put into this. Okay, what we take these inputs and what we're going to output is a gate level net list going over to the gate level abstraction uh, that describes how uh, what kind of logic gates we use to um, to implement this RTL and how the connectivity is between it. Um, the actual um, synthesis is converting this RTL into a into a logic netlist, and then we do what's called technology mapping, which we take this logic netlist and actually uh, use gates that we have available in our standard cell library um, to implement it. Um, then we go usually through several processes throughout the way of optimization, which we try to meet these constraints that we defined before in terms of timing, area, power, and other things. Um, and then we do all kinds of checks at the end, like running gate level simulation to see that um, these things work uh, after uh, turning it into gates. We run logic equivalence or formal verification where we see mathematically that the gate level that we got is equivalent to the RTL that we put in by, again, a third party and not just by uh, uh, trusting the synthesis tool. Um, we run static timing analysis to meet, see that it meets our timing constraints that we defined before. And we may uh, estimate things such as power and area according to our gate level that we've got. So moving from logic synthesis, we now have a gate level net list and we can start doing our physical implementation, our back end, our physical design, where we're going to take these uh, the sea of gates we have and put them onto a chip. So what we have here is kind of a, an overview of what a chip could look like. Um, what you see here is we have, a, we have the size of our chip. 
we need to have some sort of uh, connection to the outer world, which would be with these like landing pads where we can wire bond some uh, actual uh, wires that are not nanometric onto. So they take up a lot of room. And around here we have what we call an IO ring, which are um, buffers that uh, are big enough to deal with the high capacitances and inductances of the outer world. So we have these just large buffers that uh, interface between the internal core of the chip, which is at these nanometer sizes, with the outside world, which is already uh, more like the millimeter sizes. Okay, um, so this is actually kind of all wasted. It's just for this interface with the outside world. Whatever we can stick, therefore, on the chip is very um, uh, efficient and so forth. And we have different things here. We have to provide power to the whole chip, so the, our VDD and our ground um, rails. We have to place all the standard cells. We usually make these rows of VDD and ground and stick standard cells inside. We'll learn about that. Um, we have to bring a clock to all of our um, flip-flops and different IPs that receive a clock. So we need to do clock tree synthesis. And we need to route all the different connections between the different logic gates and the IPs without making shorts and without uh, disrupting the design rules. So uh, we need to do all that. We, of course, need to run verification such as our design rule check, our layout versus schematic check, antenna check, and electromigration checks. And we should also run our logic equivalents to make sure that what came out in the end is what we started with. And if we can, run post layout simulations to see how our logic simulates when we stick in the actual delays and so forth of our chip. So that's uh, the physical design stage. Um, what we have for physical uh, I implementation is we, s we have to start with, again, we chose some sort of a process. So we have the foundry, which provides the device models, how the transistors actually work. We have a tech file, which describes basically what kind of layers we have and what their parasitics are. And we have design rules, which say how we're allowed to actually lay out these uh, these different layers that we were provided with. We have different vendors, which again, these are IP providers. They could be internal to our company, but they are usually or often they're uh, external off the shelf providers who sell, sell us uh, parts. So we, they provide us with standard cells. They provide us with a compiler for SRAMs or ROMs or different types of memories. They provide us with these IO buffers that talk to the rest of the, uh, to the outside world and different types of hard IPs, such as maybe analog blocks and, and other types of IPs. And then we have the front end design, which is usually um, what we are talking about as designed in house. And there we have the spec, what we need to meet to, to meet our marketing design requirements. We have the architecture of our chip. We have the RTL that our designers wrote. And we have the verification that told us that the RTL actually does what it's supposed to. We take all of these three things together and we enter this physical design world, which we're going to discuss quite a bit uh, in, in our lectures here. So the back end flow is very complex, but let's have a quick overview over it. And by the end of this course, you'll know it all. OK, so we start with, again, RTL, uh, this uh, register transfer level code that we wrote, Verilog, VHDL, etc. We start with this SDC, which is a uh, constraints file. And we'll, we'll learn all about SDC, about the format, and what we constrain and what we describe in it. And we start with our um, IPs provided by the IP vendors, such as the standard cells and the different macros. We take those three things, and we provide them to the synthesis tool, which provides us with a gate level of how everything is mapped to this technology and uh, how it's connected together. At that point, we lose all, all of our uh, behavioral model. We don't exactly understand. We can't really read the code anymore. We can just see a bunch of gates that are connected together. OK, um, at the next stage, we will have some sort of definitions for design for test and uh, put our gate level inside a uh, automatic test pattern generation tool. And we will get uh, abilities to, uh, to test this. We'll um, learn that towards the end of the course. Okay, then we can take our floor plan, which is how uh, we decided our chip would look and what different parts we have in our chip and maybe when we took big blocks and placed them. And we take different things like the power grid and special routes that we have to do uh, previous to uh, doing the rest of the work. And we uh, put our whole sea of gates into this uh, placement algorithm, which puts every single one of these millions of gates down into some sort of a, a place inside um, our floor plan. Uh, we come out of this with a place design. So we have actual coordinates for every single one of these cells that we had in our gate level netlist. 
Okay, now we provide some clock definitions. Since we know in our place design exactly where each flip-flop in e every clocked element is, we can now provide a clock to it, and we use some sort of a clock tree synthesis tool, which uh, designs the clock tree and provides uh, a low skew net to each of these clocks. Again, this is stuff that we'll learn about in uh, future lectures. Once we have our design with our clock tree, we can take our router, which goes and um, connects each and every one of the uh, pins of the different cells and different IPs together without um, doing anything that it's not supposed to according to the design rules. And then we have a fully routed or fully laid out design. Of course, we have to take this and do all the different types of checks, such as uh, running static timing analysis, DRC and LDS, checking density, checking antennas, uh, inserting decaps, uh, checking power and electromigration, and running extractions and so forth. Uh, once uh, we were satisfied with what we got, we can transfer this over, uh, we can export that as what's uh, known as a GDS2 uh, file, which is just a format for describing layout, which we usually send to the fabrication plant for making the photo masks. So, Again, after routing the design, we do parasitic extraction. We run static timing analysis, taking signal integrity into account. We run DRC, LVS, ERC, DFM. We run post layout gate level simulations if possible. We run power analysis. We run DFT. We run logic uh, equivalents. We do all this type of a stuff and we can make our chip. So um, we're going to learn all about that, but already in this lecture, we discussed quite a few um, new terminology and so forth. So um, here's just a short list of some of these things. And uh, I will describe references and who I use for different parts of the, the lectures, especially if I didn't put a uh, specific uh, uh, reference uh, on each picture. But I just wanted to special thanks for this uh, this. Um, overview here to Nir Sever who as I said uh, taught me a lot of the stuff I know here and helped me design my first chip uh, as a master student. Um, the IDESA digital course which is a great course if you can take it teaching this type of stuff at a practical level and Marvel where I worked and I got a lot of the experience and knowledge that I know. So that's all for right now.